Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebri and welcome to part two in this series on mental practicing. Um, so in this part we are going to talk about brain activation during mental practicing and also what to do if you're not very good at it. So let's start with the brain activation. The short story is that when you mental practice and when you physical practice there are very similar areas of the brain that are activated. It's not 100% identical activation because if it were you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between mental practicing and physical practicing like you'd be hallucinating while you're mental practicing and I think that would be pretty scary. So it's not completely identical but it's very very close. This image here is showing the areas of the brain that are active when people are doing motor imagery. So for us that means feeling things inside your head, action observation, watching somebody else do something, and movement execution, so actually doing the skill. And you can see that the areas of the brain that are activated are very similar between these three different activities. This image is showing the areas of the brain that are active in common between two different activities. So at the top, um, the parts that are colored pink, those are the areas of the brain that are active when somebody is doing motor imagery and also action observation. So that little upside down U symbol basically means areas in common between these two activities. Um, and so you can see in the second part with the yellow, um, the parts that are colored in yellow, these are the places that are active in both motor imagery, so feeling yourself doing something and actually doing that thing. Um, and so you can see um, between these various pictures that it's a lot of the same areas and there are many areas in common between doing things, watching somebody do that thing, and feeling yourself doing that thing without actually doing it. All right, let's look at each of these areas in more detail. Um, so just a quick review of gross brain anatomy. So the brain has four lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. One area that we see activation in the brain when doing both mental and physical practice is the parietal lobe. The communication between the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes also seems to be really important for both mental and physical practicing. People that have brain damage that disrupts this uh, communication have a really hard time with both kinds of practicing, actually. Two areas in the frontal lobe that seem especially important for this communication with the parietal lobe are the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex. The supplementary motor cortex, known as the SMA, is involved in controlling movements, especially planning complex movements. You can see here in the picture where it's located in the brain. When you actually move, you see the SMA proper activated, whereas when you mentally practice, it's the very front part of the SMA that's activated only. So the very front part of the SMA is usually involved in movement preparation, like when you're getting ready to move but not actually moving. So it would make sense that that's what's activated when you're mentally practicing because you're not actually moving. The premotor cortex, which you can also see here in the picture, does a lot of things in terms of motor activation, um, but it's really important in helping you select the correct plan for your movements so they're organized. It makes sense that when you're doing mental and physical practice, the premotor cortex would be activated because you need to plan the correct order of your movements regardless of whether you're imagining them or actually doing them. When you actually move, it's the motor cortex itself that is involved to execute those motions. Two other areas of the brain that are activated when you do something and also when you mental practice something are the cerebellum and the putamen. So the cerebellum is this part of the brain you can see in the picture. Um, and it's important for a lot of motor things, particularly coordination. Um, the cerebellum is actually really affected by alcohol. So that's why when someone has had too much to drink, they're really uncoordinated. The putamen is part of a larger structure in the brain called the basal ganglia here. You can see in this picture that the basal ganglia is made up of many different parts. I've tried to highlight the putamen so you can locate it more easily in this diagram. Um, but anyway, the putamen is associated with controlling the speed of movements, whether you're imagining them or actually doing them. You don't see putamen activity when people are observing somebody else do the motion because you can't control the speed of what you're watching, right? But you do see the putamen activated both when you're mental practicing a skill and when you're actually doing it. Most of the studies that have been done on mental practicing are in athletes or, or people just moving or imagining moving. Um, and so obviously they're not gonna discuss sound, uh, but that's a really important part of mental practicing for us as musicians. 
when people mental practice, you don't find activation in primary auditory cortex, which is what's active anytime you hear something, but you find activation in secondary auditory areas. Basically, once you've heard something real in the world, it's processed by the primary auditory cortex, and then that information gets sent out to secondary auditory areas for further processing. And so when you mental practice, it's these secondary areas that are active. All right, so maybe you've tried mental practicing and you're like, I can't do this very well. I can't feel things in my head. I can't hear things in my head. Or they're kind of fuzzy. I can't really do this very clearly. What should I do? So there's really interesting research looking at people that are good at mental practicing and not so good at mental practicing. Um, and there's really interesting differences. So let's look at that research next. One study looked at people that were good at mental practicing and people that weren't so good at mental practicing and had them both imagine doing a skill and then actually perform the skill. They found that when they were mental practicing, the people who were good at it had a much more focused brain activation than the people who were not so good at it, which is evidence that in the people who were not so good at it, their brain had to work a lot harder. What was especially interesting to me is when they actually performed the skill. So when they actually performed the skill, their ability was the same. There was no difference in their ability to do it, but their brain activation was still really different. When they actually performed the skill, the people who were not so good at mental practicing had many more brain areas activated, which is evidence of less efficient brain use and brain activation. Also an interesting detail in the people that weren't so good at mental practicing when they actually performed this skill, their anterior putamen, one of those parts we talked about is active when you're performing or mental practicing something, the anterior putamen was active in those people, which is typically what you see when you're right at the beginning of learning something and you're not very good at it yet. Whereas the people who were better at mental practicing, it was their posterior putamen that was activated, which is usually what you see when you're better at a skill. And so it seems that being better at mental practicing means you're using your, your brain more efficiently and at a higher level of skill, even when you're actually performing the action. Okay, but maybe people are just born better at doing it, right? Um, and I'm gonna take a quick aside here to talk about something called aphantasia. So aphantasia is um, the inability to see images in your head. So if you have aphantasia, when you picture something in your head, you don't actually see anything. I am trying to sort out whether I have aphantasia or not, because when I picture something in my head, I don't see anything. It bears zero resemblance to anything visual. Um, I have a concept of it and that concept is very detailed and I can tell you things about it, but I definitely do not see anything. Um, aphantasia can happen in any sense. I am also trying to sort out whether this extends to sound for me. When I hear something in my head, I don't actually hear anything. I have an idea of it. It's very uh, detailed and clear. I can tell you if I'm playing wrong notes or not, um, but I don't actually hear anything. It, it bears zero resemblance to sound. It's very difficult to talk about people's experience inside their head, so I don't know if what I'm experiencing matches what other people experience, um, but I will say, like, if I see a picture of my mom's apple pie, I can, like, literally taste and smell that. That's really different than my experience of seeing or hearing something in my head. Seeing or hearing it feels like, that feels like a metaphor. I'm not actually hearing or seeing anything. So, if you have aphantasia, and aphantasia exists on a spectrum, right? So, some people have zero ability to conceive of anything visual or auditory inside their head. Some people have a little bit more. Some people are on the other side. They have hyperphantasia, which means it's extremely vivid. Um, so anyway, if you have aphantasia, that's, that's a very rare thing, and that's not really what we're talking about. All right, aside over. So what if you're not good at mental practicing? I will say when I started mental practicing, I could sort of feel things in my head and I could sort of a little bit hear things, but not really. Now I can do both very easily and very clearly. So from my own personal experience, yes, you can get better at this, but what does the science say about that? It's obviously very hard to know exactly what's going on in somebody's head when they're doing mental practicing. All you can really rely on is their report of, yeah, it's vivid or no, it's not. But there is a way to measure it in sort of um, an indirect way. 
So we know that when people mental practice something, the muscles involved in that action are activated when people are mental practicing. It's not as much activation as if they were actually doing it, like throwing a ball, right? It's gonna have a lot more activation if you actually throw the ball in your muscles than if you mental practice throwing a ball, but you still find muscle activation even when you're imagining it. So you can measure that muscle activation and see how that differs between people who are good at mental practicing and people who are not. This motor activation is called a motor evoked potential, MEP. Um, and that's what they're measuring in all of these studies that we're gonna talk about. One interesting finding is that when people report that they are good at mental imaging, imagining themselves doing something, you find activation in the muscle specific to the muscle that would be used for whatever they're imagining. Whereas people who are not as good at that skill, imagining themselves doing something, you find more general muscle activation. So it's not targeted specifically to the muscle actually involved. So this brings us to whether mental imaging and being able to feel and hear things inside your body is something you're born with, you're just naturally better at it, or whether it's something you can improve at, because we can measure this with the MEPs. So there's a very smart study that was done to look at this question. And in this study, they had tennis pros and people who played tennis for fun, you know, on the weekends with their friends or whatever, but definitely were not professional players. And they had both groups of people imagine swinging a tennis racket, a table tennis paddle, and a golf club. And they were measuring their motor evoked potential, the muscle, the muscle activation, while they were imagining these three things. Often what they're looking at in these MEP studies is the amplitude, the size of the MEP, because a larger MEP is thought to reflect a better ability to imagine doing something. So the more clearly you can imagine it, the larger um, motor evoked potential you're gonna find. So what they found with these two groups of tennis players is really interesting. For the casual players, there was no difference in the size of the MEP for the tennis racket, the table tennis paddle, or the golf club. What they found in the pro tennis players was really different. They found that when they imagined swinging the tennis racket, the MEP was much bigger than when they imagined swinging a table tennis paddle or a golf club. The pro tennis players also reported that it was much easier for them to imagine swinging the tennis racket than the paddle or the golf club. So this is evidence that the ability to imagine doing something can be modified, can be improved, with practice, right? It doesn't make any sense to argue that the tennis pros became tennis pros because they were naturally better at imagining swinging a tennis racket than any other sports implement, right? Like that really does not make sense. Like why would somebody be born with the ability to imagine swinging a tennis racket really well, but not a golf club and not a te table tennis paddle, right? The only explanation that makes sense to for these findings is that they are better at imagining swinging a tennis racket and you see this reflected in the MEP because they've practiced it. Right? So if mental practicing is hard for you, all is not lost. You can get better at it by practicing it. So in the next and last uh, video in this series, I'm gonna answer some commonly asked questions about mental practicing to hopefully help you do it better. So I hope you'll join me over there.